Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to this special press conference. It follows the Governing Council's decision last night on the strategy review. We are joined here on stage by President Lagarde and by Pre Vice President de Guindos. My name is Wolfgang Preussel. President Lagarde, please, for the opening remarks. Thank you very much. So the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to a special press conference. Yesterday, the Governing Council unanimously approved the ECB's new monetary policy strategy. This brings to a successful conclusion the strategic review that we have been conducting over the last 18 months, drawing on an immense collective effort by staff at the ECB and at the national central banks of the euro area. We have worked within the existing treaty and taken the ECB's primary mandate of price stability as a given. The review has allowed us to challenge our thinking, engage with numerous stakeholders, reflect, discuss, and reach common ground on how to adapt our strategy. The new strategy is reflected in the document entitled the ECB Monetary Policy Strategy Statement. One page recto verso. That was published earlier today. It is a strong foundation that will guide us in the conduct of monetary policy in the years to come. Let me explain the key elements of our new strategy in a bit more detail. To improve the clarity of our price stability objective and with the aim of better anchoring inflation expectations, we, the Governing Council, have decided to amend our formulation of the objective. The Governing Council considers that price stability is best maintained by aiming for a 2% inflation target over the medium term. A 2% inflation target is consistent with standard definitions of price stability and provides a safety margin to protect the effectiveness of monetary policy in responding to disinflationary shocks and to guard against the risk of deflation. This specific quantitative target is clear, too, and easy to communicate and provides a strong anchor for inflation expectations, which is essential to maintain price stability. It replaces the previous double key formulation of below but close to 2%, which was widely seen as too elaborate and occasionally giving rise to misperceptions about the governing council's aspirations. The new formulation removes any possible ambiguity and resolutely conveys that 2% is not a ceiling. The Governing Council's commitment to the 2% target is symmetric. What we mean by symmetry is that the Governing Council considers negative and positive deviations of inflation from the target to be equally undesirable. To maintain the symmetry of its inflation target, the Governing Council recognizes the importance of taking into account the implications of the effective lower bound on nominal interest rates. In particular, when nominal interest rates tend to be low throughout the business cycle, like it is at present, the economy operates not too far from the lower bound. Episodes in which the policy rate is constrained at the lower bound are often associated with disinflationary pressure. So addressing this requires especially forceful or persistent monetary policy measures to avoid 
negative deviation from the inflation target becoming entrenched. In these conditions, in the face of large adverse shocks, the ECB's policy response will, as appropriate and grounded in a careful proportionality analysis, include initially especially forceful monetary policy measures. In addition, closer to the, to the effective lower bound, it may also call for a more persistent use of its monetary policy instruments. This may also imply a transitory period in which inflation is moderately above target. The Governing Council judged that the Harmonized Index of Consumer Prices, the HICP, remains the appropriate price measure for assessing the achievement of our price stability objective. At the same time, we have heard the calls of European citizens for a broader coverage of housing costs in the HICP. The Governing Council has therefore recommended a roadmap for the inclusion of owner-occupied housing in the HICP, while recognizing that this is a multi-year project to be led by Eurostat. During the transition period, the main reference index for monetary policy will remain the current HICP, but initial estimates of owner-occupied housing costs will play a supplementary role alongside our set of broader inflation measures and will help us assess the contribution of housing costs to inflation. Our new strategy confirms the medium-term orientation of our monetary policy, which since the inception of the ECB has been an important principle of the strategy. It recognizes that monetary policy cannot and should not attempt to fine-tune short-term developments in inflation. Monetary policy affects the economy with a variable time lags. The medium-term orientation allows us to be forward-looking and respond flexibly to fluctuations in output and inflation. Flexibility is important since the appropriate policy response depends on the circumstances as well as on the source, magnitude, and persistence of the shock affecting the economy. The medium-term orientation also allows us to cater for other considerations relevant to the pursuit of price stability. Employment, financial stability risks, and climate change are some of the areas that we looked into in greater depth during the strategy review. We have also carefully reviewed the appropriateness of the instruments in our policy toolkit. It is clear that the set of ECB policy rates, the rate on our main refinancing operations, the deposit facility rate, and the marginal lending rate will remain our primary instrument. But in a low interest rate environment, in which policy rates are more likely to encounter and remain constrained at the lower bound, the ECB will continue to employ other instruments when the need arises. Forward guidance, asset purchases, and longer-term refinancing operations over the past decade have helped mitigate the limitations generated by the lower bound and will remain an integral part of the ECB's toolkit to be used as appropriate. We have also made important changes to our analytical framework. This framework provides the foundation for our monetary policy decisions, including the regular proportionality assessment of the effectiveness, efficiency, and side effects of our measures. Historically, the ECB has been known for its two pillars, which identified risks to price stability as originating from two distinct domains, the economic analysis and the monetary analysis. These two sources of risks 
were cross-checked against each other to form an overall assessment. Our new strategy acknowledges the advantages of having two specialized area of analysis on the economy, but also recognizes the value of integrating the analysis in a world in which there are multiple feedback channels from the monetary and financial spheres to the broader economy and vice versa. This new integrated assessment builds on the evolution that our economic and monetary analysis have undergone over time. The monetary analysis has increasingly focused on assessing the transmission of monetary policy measures, as well as the risks to price stability from financial imbalances. Meanwhile, owing to a weakening of the link between monetary aggregates and inflation, the original focus of the monetary analysis has become less important. At the same time, the global financial crisis brought to the fore the relevance of macro-financial linkages that further emphasize the need for integrated analysis. We have acknowledged that climate change is an essential challenge for the world and is of strategic importance for the ECB's mandate. The Governing Council therefore decided to account explicitly for the implications of climate change and the carbon transition in our new strategy. The Governing Council today commits to an ambitious action plan outlined in the dedicated press release. The action plan covers several key areas. First, we will further expand our analytical capacity in macroeconomic modeling and develop statistical indicators and new tools to assess the implications of climate change for monetary policy transmission and for price stability. Second, the ECB will introduce environmental sustainability disclosure requirements for eligibility for collateral as and asset purchases. Third, we will adapt our risk assessment framework, our corporate sector asset purchases, and the collateral framework for climate-related risks. During our review, we also addressed the communication of our monetary policy. We heard directly how our policies affect the lives of European citizens and their desire to better understand those policies. Our last review, 2003, took place well before smartphones were around. So there was a strong case for enhancing our communication with the outside world. You will notice some changes in the coming weeks relating to our regular communication. For example, a new, more narrative-based and more concise monetary policy statement will replace the introductory statement at our monetary policy press conferences. But also our monetary policy communication geared towards the wider public will be adapted through a more visualized and more accessible approach. And reflecting the successful experience with the listening events, the Governing Council intends to continue to interact on a regular basis with the public via Eurosystem outreach events. The review of our strategy that we have just completed took place 18 years after the previous one. Looking ahead, the rapidly changing world that we live in means that we, we cannot wait for another 18 years before undertaking the next review. A regular review cycle with the Governing Council periodically reassessing the appropriateness of its monetary policy strategy will ensure that the strategy remains fit for purpose. It will also further enhance the ECB's transparency and accountability to European citizens. We intend to carry out the next assessment in 2025. 
the Governing Council yesterday also endorsed a longer explanatory overview note on the ECB's monetary policy strategy, which will be published right after the press conference. We are now ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the first question today goes to Carolyn Locke of Bloomberg News. Carolyn, please. Hi, good afternoon, President Lagarde, and thanks for taking my question. Uh, I, I have two, if I may. Um, firstly, on your new symmetric inflation target, you said you may tolerate a transitory period of moderately higher inflation when the economy is close to the lower bound. So how much of an overshoot is the ECB willing to tolerate and over what time frame? And secondly, um, now that the ECB's inflation goal has been uh, clarified, as you said, and strengthened, uh, what is the ECB prepared to do if inflation continues to miss its goal, as it has done for much of the last decade? I mean, in your, in your statement, you suggested that many of your unconventional tools will continue to be treated as such. So can we actually expect the ECB to, to uh, be any more forceful about achieving this new aim? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your, uh, for your question. Let me get back to the basics, as I call them, uh, which is symmetric 2%, medium-term orientation, and the acknowledgement that the effective lower bound operates as a constraint. So. The essential feature of our strategy is our commitment to reach the target, to reach that 2%. When we say that it's a symmetric 2%, the Governing Council regards as equally undesirable deviation that are either positive or negative. Third point, we know that 2% is not going to be constantly on target there might be some moderate temporary deviation in either direction of that 2%, and that is okay. What we are very concerned about is any uh, sustainable, durable, significant deviation from the target, and that will require forceful reaction in both direction. The fourth item, which is uh, going directly to, you, to your point, is that we recognize that the effective lower bound constitute a constraint. And therefore, we have to take specific action in order to simply maintain the symmetry. And in that situation, it requires an especially forceful or persistent reaction in order to avoid that negative deviation from the target risks entrenching inflation expectations. So, in case of an adverse shock in that situation, more forceful and especially forceful reaction will be needed. And closer to the effective lower bound, those actions might be more persistent. And this may imply that for a transitory period, inflation is moderately above our target. But the key commitment we have is our commitment to 2%. And we respond to the effective lower bound constraint by deciding to take specially forceful or persistent action in the face of adverse shock in order to avoid that inflation expectations be entrenched. So, turning to your second question, we, and you have, I'm sure that you have read uh, already carefully the uh, two pages um, policy strategy statement, and we have a whole section in that statement about our instrument. And it is not randomly that they are mentioned interest rates first, and the other tools that we have used with good success over the last 10 years. So it is very clear to all of us, uh, 
members of the governing council that the key and first and foremost instrument that we will use and that we use uh, are the ECB interest rates. The whole category of them was mentioned in my introductory remarks. But we also acknowledge that in circumstances such as the one we are operating under, the other tools that we have used successfully over the last 10 years are necessary tools in order to respond to the possible adverse shock that we are facing. And as a result of that, those tools, by that we mean the uh, forward guidance, uh, the um, asset purchase programs, uh, the targeted um, long, longer term infl um, Teltro uh, refinancing operation and, um, and the negative rates eventually, are necessary tools that will remain in the toolbox and that we will be able to continue to use if needed in accordance with a good proportionality analysis that we would always conduct. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question goes to Balaj Korani of Reuters. Balaj, please. Good afternoon and thanks for taking my question. Uh, President Lagarde, can you tell me specifically how housing costs will be taken into account uh, before HICP is fixed up? I'm sure you did some, some exposed calculations on inflation with owner-occupied housing included. What are those numbers showing? What would inflation have been uh, with, with that included? Uh, second question is going back to what Carolyn was asking about, about tolerating an overshoot. Uh, I understand that, but tolerating and targeting are two very different things. Could, so could you just confirm that after periods of low inflation, the ECB will not seek a higher inflation rate, but merely tolerate it if that happens, but that's still not the target to overshoot. Thank you. Thank you for your two questions. You all, you all put two questions to me. Um, on your first point, uh, what was decided uh, by the Governing Council was to account for the consumer cost of the uh, owner's occupied house. So it has, it has nothing to do with the investment cost that an owner incurs. It has to do with the consumer cost that the owner of a house actually uh, incurs. So it is that particular portion that we want to take into account in order to respond to the frustration of many of the Europeans that we have consulted and that reached out to us that cost of housing was not properly accounted for in the uh, inflation measurements as, as they saw it. If you look historically over the course of time, it, it is not a, a very significant variation from the inflation uh, as measured by the HICP. It, it, it is quite minimal and it, it varies over time. There are periods of time when uh, those uh, consumers' costs are a bit higher and there are periods when it is a bit lower. On average, it's a minimal, minimal uptick from the, uh, from the HIPC uh, number. So that, that's the impact that it would have. On, you, on your second point, let me again uh, repeat what we, have, uh, what we have agreed and what we're committed to do. We are committed to target 2%. And we are defining very clearly what symmetry is to us. Equally undesirable deviation on both sides of the target, positive or negative. But we also acknowledge that given the effective lower bound that constitutes a constraint on us, we have to take some special action to restore the symmetry, if you will. And to that end, we recognize that in case of adverse shock, it will require especially forceful or persistent action on the part of the ECB. And we also acknowledge that given that specially forceful or persistent action, this may imply transitory periods in which inflation is moderately above targets. You know, there are multiple ways to deal with uh, the effective lower bound. And this is something that many central banks around the world are facing at the moment in this uh, circumstances of low 
uh, interest rates. And our response to that effective lower bound, which we account for, which we acknowledge, is this specially forceful or persistent reaction in order to avoid that low inflation actually entrench inflation expectations at a lower level than our target. That, that's our response. So let's try not to compare it with what others are doing elsewhere. There are multiple ways to deal with it. This is our way of dealing uh, with the uh, effective lower bound in order to restore symmetry. Thank you. The next question goes to Eric Albert of uh, Le Monde. Eric, over to you, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Mrs. Lagarde. Um, I've got a, s a very simple question, really, which is, um, in what way does this review really change the way you will conduct monetary policy? Um, you know, in a way, uh, symmetry was already in place, so, so is, it, is it simply a clarification, in effect, of what you were already doing? Um, and, and one question on climate change. Um, when is it, that, or how long before, you change the way you start buying, um, buying your assets according to climate change criteria? How, how long before it happens? On you, let, let me start with the uh, your second question. If you, look, if you look at the press release that I think was issued, right, the one on climate change, if you look at the back of that press release, you have a timetable. And I'm very keen on that timetable, as are all members of the Governing Council. It was carefully drafted and prepared to give not only the purpose that we have, the action that we take, but also the timeline by which we deliver. So it's not, you know, words, words, words. It's we are facing an issue, climate change, which is the major challenge that the world is facing. We are not the primary actors. We're not driving the bus, if you will. But we are on that bus, and we have to look at whether or not under our mandate, it has an impact on price stability. And as I said, it's not just words, it's not a speech. It's a commitment of the entire governing council with delivery time, deliverables, and pursuit of objectives. So let's not lose sight of that. It's a pretty strong step forward that the euro system is committed to at large. Uh, we have now set up uh, a climate change center here at the ECB. All the committees that are working on the framework, on the operations of our monetary policy, are mobilized to do the work that is needed in order to deliver what needs to be delivered. So I, I, you know, I don't mean to go through the entire list that you have on those two pages of our timeline, but we take that very seriously, and action has already started. So on your other question, Ah, this strategy is really not much. I'm very sorry, but I don't believe so. I think it is quite a lot. Let me mention the key changes that I see myself. We went from below but close to 2% to 2%. It is simple to communicate. It is solid. It is well accepted in the international economic community. And it's a good balancing act between having enough room to maneuver in order to resist and fight disinflation and avoiding the welfare cost of having too high inflation. 2%. Second, instead of having this, um, I would say, um, rather unnoticed at the time um, symmetry, because that was, you are correct, mentioned in the July 2019 introductory um, statement of the monetary policy, we put it right in the center of uh, our statement. It is symmetric. We define symmetry. There is no ambiguity which was associated with a symmetry that might have been alleged to be under the two rather than on both sides of two. So it's this two simple and solid. It is symmetric. And we reaffirm that the whole governing council regards as undesirable deviations on both sides of symmetry, which is the perfect explanation of what we mean by symmetry. Third, we recognize very specifically uh, that the proximity to the, the effective lower bound 
requires, as I have said twice, but I'm happy to repeat it ad nauseum, that's okay, forceful or persistent monetary policy action. So we're just not saying symmetry in abstract. We say we know that at the effective lower bound, it is more complicated and there is that trap element about it and it needs to be resisted because otherwise we run the risk of having inflation expectations entrenched and that is very detrimental to price stability and the room we have to maneuver. Third, we just discussed it um, with the previous uh, journalist, we want the owners occupied housing cost to be better factored into uh, the, uh, the HICP new format, if you will, and in the meantime, we will take into account uh, existing um, um, indexes that actually reflect those um, owners-occupied housing costs. Fourth, uh, climate action is squarely in the middle of our strategy as well, okay, and is associated with the timeline that I have just mentioned. It's very important uh, that it be, as such, squarely in the middle of our strategy and central to what we will do in terms of our monetary framework and in terms of our monetary operations. The models that some of our teams are working on at the moment will also be very innovative in that respect. And finally, but that in, in a way has more to do with our um, internal operations, but it's also critically important, is that instead of having those two flow of, of analysis, the economic analysis and the monetary analysis, we are now clearly saying economic analysis on the one hand, monetary and financial analysis on the other hand. And we recognize that those two flows of analysis will need to be integrated because there is so much interference and interconnection between the two as we have clearly seen since the great financial crisis. So I've only mentioned the, the key changes uh, that are uh, embedded in the strategy review. And I can assure you that it has been a lot of hard work uh, amongst all of us uh, in the last few months. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's for Martin Arnold of the Financial Times to ask a question. Martin, please. Yes, hello, uh, President Lagarde. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well. How are you? Uh, very well, thanks. Congratulations on the new strategy announcement. Could you uh, just address this question? Um, uh, sorry to make you repeat yourself, and hopefully we'll, we'll get a little bit further on it. I'm still not clear on whether this is a target for you to overshoot the inflation target after a long period of low uh, interest rates, low inflation and low inflation expectations. Is that, is that a commitment of the ECB now to overshoot the target? Uh, in response to that period of, as you said, the risk of entrenched low inflationary expectations? Or is it just something that you're saying might happen as a result of your response to those conditions? I think it's important to clarify that. Secondly, there were some expectations among analysts, and it doesn't seem to have come to fruition, that you might address questions such as the, the issuer limits question, so the, the flexibility of your asset purchase program. Uh, can, you, can you address that? Because some analysts are saying that may still be a, a binding constraint on your uh, ability to act in response to low uh, inflation. Um, uh, can, you, can you talk about that, please? Thank you. Sure, sure. Okay, on your, on your first question, I want to repeat and reaffirm as, as um, strongly as, as, as I can that our commitment is to deliver on our target. Our target is 2%. We are committed to delivering uh, on, on that price stability target that we have newly defined. And we recognize that there will be constraint to that effect because of the lower bound environment in which uh, monetary uh, policy action is taken, as a result of which we know that to resist in, in the face of uh, adverse negative shock, we will have to deploy an especially forceful or persistent um, reaction. Because what we want to do, as you very well picked up, is to avoid that the negative deviations actually entrench 
inflation expectations, which would indeed be detrimental uh, to the price stability objective that we pursue. And what, in the, you know, in the process of defining our commitment, this especially forceful and uh, or um, persistent reaction, this may well imply for a temporary period um, inflation that is moderately above target. Are we doing average inflation targeting like the Fed? The answer is no, very squarely, because there are multiple ways to respond to this effective lower bound constraint. And ours is the one that I have described, which is to accept this specially forceful reaction or persistent reaction, depending on how close we are to the lower bound. And it is perfect recognition that this may imply temporary deviation, temporary period in which uh, inflation is moderately above our target. I cannot be clearer than that. Thank you. And now the next question goes to Isabella Bufaki of uh, Il Sole 24 Ore. Isabella, please. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, President Lagarde, I have two questions uh, myself. Um, you said that when the economy is, is uh, operating close to the lower bound on nominal interest rates, it requires especially forceful or persistent monetary policy action. Can you give us an example of what is an especially forceful monetary policy action? And my second question is on the um, toolkit and the next uh, uh, governing council uh, meeting. It is the first one on the 22nd of July that will be applying the new strategy. What changes could we expect on your toolkit uh, moving from the old strategy to the new strategy? Thank you. I tell you something that will be different uh, on the 22nd of July, which I think is the day of, uh, of our press conference. And uh, based on what we have agreed in our strategy review, uh, the introductory statement that I will read to you and that you will receive uh, will be shorter, crispier, and uh, probably more to the point and less jargonic than what we, you were used to. So I'm just cautioning uh, many of you because uh, you might be disappointed not to see the usual uh, series of paragraphs and be able to do the compare line by line because we are determined to improve on our communication and to make it uh, probably more plain English, uh, shorter and, and easier to understand, including by the experts that you are around this call. But that, that's one of the changes that we will see. In terms of, of Toolkits, as I said, uh, all the tools that we have been using, which are listed, if I recall, in paragraph eight of the statement. It might not be paragraph eight, actually. I just want to check for you. Um, yes, it is paragraph eight. So they're all there. They're listed by, in, in, a, in pecking order, if you will. And all those tools are in the toolkit, uh, are in the box, and uh, will be used as appropriate and taking into account a proportionality analysis that we conduct uh, before we select uh, the instruments that we want to use in order to uh, reach our target. To give you an example of um, a forceful monetary policy reaction, I would, I would say in my you know, relatively limited uh, history as president of the ECB, I would submit that uh, the PEP that we build and further developed in the course of 2020 was definitely a forceful reaction uh, with, with a twofold approach, uh, of course, but certainly a forceful reaction uh, in order to, um, uh, to maintain price stability as much uh, as was possible under the incredible circumstances that we faced. And I would also submit that we didn't do badly in that respect and that if certainly we were not at uh, the aim of uh, below but close to 2%, but certainly uh, we did not observe a massive um, destabilization of prices. But we are not where we want to be, clearly. Thank you. 
And now, Annette Weisbach of CNBC. Annette, please. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. President Lagarde, thank you very much for taking my question. I have one very easy question. Um, whether the new inflation target um, has pushed out a potential tightening of uh, monetary policy um, in your view. And then uh, one more question on climate change policies and what it means for, um, in your view, for, for tightening of financial conditions and higher inflation rates. Because if you talk to corporates and business leaders, they're all saying that prices are on the rise and that uh, enacting climate change policies uh, will make things more expensive. So what is your view on that? Will we by greening our economy, um, actually push inflation higher. Did you say by greening the economy? Like, like by, by um, trying to or by, um, by having the carbon neutrality goal, whether this would um, have a, um, um, an accelerating effect on prices yeah. because things are getting more expensive. Um, you know, I think the jury is out on that one. Uh, I know that there are some proponents of the view that because of the additional regulations, because of the requirements, because of the transition costs, uh, it, it will have an inflationary impact. But I think that there are others uh, who view that, um, you know, with cost of energy possibly declining and other secondary effects of those changes, uh, it, it will actually have a deflationary uh, effect. So I think the jury is out, and, and uh, certainly for the moment, at least, um, we at the ECB have not concluded on, on either side of this, uh, of this propositions. And I think it, it remains to be seen uh, what, the, what the exact impact on, on inflation, the greening of our economy will be. But for the moment, we are probably in the latter camp than the, than the first camp. On, on, in relation to um, the clarity and the solidity of our objective, you know, I think it, if, you, if you were to ask those who back in uh, 2003, which was 18 years ago, uh, have indicated below but close to, I think remembering some of the comments made by one of my predecessors, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, at many ECOFIN that I attended as, as then finance minister, it was pretty clear in his mind that the ideal level was much, much closer to two and was probably a 1.95% uh, rather than these sort of expected, expect, inflation expectations that we have at the moment, either on, a, on market based or survey based, uh, as a you know, moment when we would, uh, we would begin to tighten, which I think are, are ill funded uh, given our strategy. So I don't think that by having this simple and solid 2%, uh, we are actually pushing out uh, the potential tightening uh, that would take place, no. Thank you. And the next question goes to Mark Boindermann of NRC Handelsblatt. Mark, please. Uh, thank you, President Lagarde. I have uh, two questions, if I may, related to climate change. Um, during the review, there were many uh, organizations and citizens who uh, voiced their concern about the ECB uh, buying fossil uh, polluting assets. So could you perhaps sketch out um, how uh, the asset purchases of the ECB will look uh, after uh, 2024, the, the year that is in the roadmap, um, will they be greener in, in what way? And secondly, um, uh, since the uh, ECB is a large player in financial markets, uh, what impact do you think um, this new climate policy will have on the trend towards sustainability in the financial sector? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... You know, if I fast forward into the future and I think to myself, what will um, our portfolios look like? I would say two things, uh, whether it is the uh, uh, asset purchase program if, uh, or whether it is the collaterals, I think that the disclosure uh, will be required for any bonds, any collateral to be eligible. 
So disclosure will be an absolute requirement, otherwise no eligibility. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in my science fiction moment because you're asking me to uh, fast forward into 24, which is even beyond our projection horizon. But I, I would say um, no bonds will be eligible unless it includes all the required disclosure. And by that I mean not just those that will be prescribed by the European Union, but possibly more because our internal rating might be even more stringent uh, than what will be established uh, under the CRDS and other requirements that would be imposed by the European Union. So that's number one. And when I say disclosure, it might also uh, imply elements of the transition plans that many corporates are putting together, will be putting together and updating on a regular basis so that they are actually feasible, practical and convincing. Second, um, I'm sure that by then, 2024, uh, our excellent teams will have devised ways of making sure that we conform uh, with the terms of the treaty that require proper allocation of resources. And by that I mean that risks will be better taken into account in order to determine the actual value of some of those assets. So from a risk management point of view, there will certainly be breakthrough changes that will have an impact on the value at which some of those bonds are in our current portfolio and would be there in four years' time, or those that would eventually be purchased then. Now, whether that is by way of tilting, whether this is by way of haircuts, whether I don't know. There are multiple facets uh, to that particular um, to those particular solutions, but I'm sure that they will have found uh, what, is, uh, what is needed. What role uh, will the ECB play in that respect? Well, I would hope that, uh, one, we manage our risks uh, in a more solid way in order to conform uh, to the treaty and to good management principles. And um, I would also assume that we play a bit of a, a catalyst role so that other purchasers, other investors uh, also follow suit, uh, as many actually have announced they will. And uh, I hope that that will be an encouragement. I would like to mention, by the way, that we are one of the large purchasers of, of green bonds and have uh, relaxed some of our requirements in terms of structure of, of those products uh, in order to uh, accept those bonds that uh, that are uh, climate yes uh, that are climate change related in terms of uh, structure. Thank you. And now the floor is uh, for Sumaya Keynes of uh, the Economy. Sumaya, please. Hello, um, and, and thanks for taking the question. Um, so, so my uh, my question is, both you and Mario Draghi uh, have signaled in the past that you would be happy with with an overshoot. Um, and yet, inflation has, has persistently undershot. And so the, just the one question is, um, why do you think people should believe you this time? Well, I would say, first of all, because we've learned from history. Uh, and uh, we've, we've observed um, what has worked, what hasn't worked. Let me give you an example. Uh, one of our work stream we had 13 work streams studying all aspects of monetary policy and what impacts monetary policy. One of those work streams focused on the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy and studied not only Europe, but other countries, including, for instance, Japan or the United States. And it appears quite clearly from those uh, studies that were conducted that the combination and the coordination without much consultation, actually, between fiscal policy and monetary policy can play an amplifying role or not. In other words, counter-cyclical good fiscal policies, when they take place at the same time as uh, monetary policy, can actually amplify the effects of monetary policy. I am not sure that this is something that we have observed very much until the beginning of the pandemic, when we saw effectively a strong, robust fiscal policy also support our monetary policy and vice versa. 
And I think that the combination of the two showed that it was actually quite potent, as opposed to what was observed after the uh, 2011 uh, European sovereign debt crisis, when monetary policy was very much on its own and fiscal policy was, was tightening. So I think that that's one example of learnings from the past uh, that we can, uh, we can uh, endorse and, uh, and work with. Second, I think the fact that um, the Governing Council was unanimously in support of this uh, strategy review, unanimously concerned with delivering on the target of 2%, and uh, totally on board with what it would imply in order to um, deal with the constraints of the effective lower bound, I think gives added credibility to the commitment that we have. And I was particularly pleased that after the effort that was conducted for 18 years, there was this unanimous support. Finally, uh, I would say that, and that's again looking into the future, uh, but uh, the severity of the financial crisis and the, uh, the, the incredible and tragic uh, situation of the pandemic have been um, exceptional moments which have been resisted but have not um, enabled us with the monetary policy that was deployed sometime often too much in isolation from fiscal policy to deliver on the target uh, on the aim uh, that the ECB had so let's uh, let's learn from from the past stay uh, together in this commitment to deliver on our uh, target and uh, demonstrate that uh, we mean what we say. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question goes to Domenico Conte of ANSA. Domenico, <coughs> please. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for this question, uh, President Lagarde. My question is about the timing of this decision, which kind of caught me by surprise. I mean, the decision was expected for the second half of, of this year. Uh, in the statement, it is said that uh, the first regular poly monetary policy meeting applying this new strategy would be uh, this, this next meeting in, on 22nd of July. So the question is simply why the decision was so rapid and operating for that, for that meeting? Uh, can we expect some possible recalibration of some of the tools? some of the tools, and not, not referring necessarily to the to QE or the PEP. Thank you. Well, thank you for your question, but I would, I would observe that we are in the second half of this year. And um, when something in, is ready, you don't want to procrastinate, sit around, and, uh, and continue a, a process that uh, has successfully been completed. So I think it is thanks to the enormous amount of work that was produced by staff of the entire Euro system, with the staff of the ECB uh, having clearly a, a, a driving seat in the exercise, but drawing on all the resources from all the national central banks, that we had this, um, this good process. My hope would have been to deliver much earlier, let's face it. But we had to suspend the process for six months. We had. Uh, 13 work streams working on 13 key themes for which you will be receiving, by the way, uh, before the uh, Sintra conference, a very significant amount of extremely valuable working papers that have helped us in elaborating our views, in confronting our positions, and in reaching agreement. But it is because of that work uh, that we managed to advance fast enough. And you know, when something is ready, um, <laughs> Let's be out with it. Uh, otherwise, you have the risk that you know quite well, a leak here, a leak there, and, and before you know it, you don't control the process anymore. So I think it was actually beneficial that we could early on, you know, everybody complains that Europe is always late. Well, the ECB is early. Good. Thank you. The next question goes to uh, Les Commons of Market News International, MNI. Uh, Les, please. President Lagarde, thank you very much indeed. Um, a couple of questions. The first one, um, when you ran through your four main points, what you thought were the most important points to come out of the review, you put the fact that the, the target was now at 2% and not close to but below 2%. Mm -hmm. 
Um, do you not feel that this may be a communications challenge in certain areas uh, across the Eurozone, that you're seen to be raising the inflation target at exactly the same time as inflation itself is rising? And secondly, um, the, as you start to take housing costs and housing and the cost of housing more and more into the inflation target and the decision-making process, is the governing council going to need greater access to macroprudential tools? Thank you. You know, on, on your first point, um, I've, I've partly responded earlier by telling you that the below but close to 2% was effectively very close to 2%, at least in the mind of those who invented the formula of below but close to 2% at the time when the worry was excessive inflation and not too low inflation as we have it at the moment. Uh, are we trying to move the goalpost because there is uh, factors that uh, increase prices at the moment? I, I, I really don't think so, and this is certainly not uh, the intention. I, I just want to remind you that the seminars and the discussion that we had about the 2% took place about uh, 12, months, 12, yeah, 12 months ago, at a time when inflation was certainly not um, rising, or at the time when prices were not rising as they are at the moment. Uh, added to which, and that would be the second part of my of my response to you, is that um, we we will see through uh, inflation as we see it at the moment. Um, we have good reasons to monitor carefully, to analyze very cautiously, uh, to be to be vigilant about underlying inflation in particular, and to try to disentangle what is volatile. Uh, oil-related, food-related, to make sure that our assessment is valid. But at this point in time, we certainly believe that this is a transitory um, movement that is attributable to you know, some, some uh, supply shortages, some bottlenecks, uh, some uh, oil-related uh, factors, and, uh, and some very uh, specific issue relating to VAT increase and, and all the rest of it. So. This, this is clearly not a little device to go in the direction of. No, not at all. We, we, are, we believe that this 2% is clearer, simpler to communicate, solid, and a good balance. Uh, added to which, it gives us um, parity with a lot of other uh, central banks around the world which are also operating at 2%, which is the generally accepted definition of, of price stability. Um, on, on your second point, I think it's... Um, the reason we included the um, owners occupied housing cost and only the consumer part of that, not the investment cost, I, I want to be very specific on that, uh, is, is really caused by the very strong feedback that we heard uh, from the Europeans with whom we had those many outreach events and who were vocal and loud on the fact that housing costs uh, should be properly accounted for because they constituted a major component of their budget. So that, that's what has really uh, caused our determination to include them on a temporary basis as additional component. And hopefully, if Eurostat is also in agreement with us uh, on, a, on a more um, solid and, and permanent basis. Thank you. Thank you. And this concludes uh, today's press conference on the results of the strategy review. I would like to thank everybody for their interest. Uh, if you want to, we'll see each other back on the 22nd of July, which will be the next regular monetary policy press conference. I hope you all stay well, safe, and healthy, and see you then. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.